Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is um, Michael Sinatra. I'm an English professor at the University of Montréal. Et c'est mon grand plaisir de vous accueillir ce matin pour une séance sur les big data. Je commencerai d'abord par un mot d'excuse. Stéphane Sinclair, qui devait se joindre à nous, euh, a dû rester à la maison pour s'occuper de sa petite fille malade. Euh, donc il envoie ses, ses regrets. Et Chuck a gentiment accepté de parler un peu plus, comme nous l'avions pensé, des deux perspectives et des notions de, de big data, d'infrastructure, qui ont une importance pour notre séance. Je tiens d'abord à remercier Ray Simmons, euh, qui est l'administrateur de la Fédération en charge de la diffusion de la recherche, pour m'inviter à avoir préparé cette séance avec le comité consultatif de la diffusion de la recherche que je dirige euh, au Congrès. So, the idea behind this workshop this morning, which will last about an hour, by the way, because we have to eat here, you know, at, at 12.15, so we'll be finishing at noon, moving out briefly, they'll set up lunch, and then we'll come back at 12.15 with everybody else to have our lunch. So during this hour this morning, we want to explore the idea of the latest technical revolution, and primarily the idea of how do we move forward with the questions of digital scholarship infrastructure. These have been major changes in the last decade, and it's very important for the Federation and its constituents, organization and members to be part of that you know, dialogue. So in order to help us think about the idea of big data, the need for infrastructure, the place of social sciences and humanities within these large-scale issues, to welcome Chuck Humphrey, who is the Research Data Management Service Coordinator for the University of Alberta Libraries, where he has provided data services since 1992. Shirks has you know, many years of experience around the topic, but you know, in some ways, in 2007, was one of the key steps for him to become the Shirks representative to the International Data Forum, which led to his involvement in the Global Science Forum for Data and Research Infrastructure for the Social Sciences and Humanities. During that period, he was also member of the Canadian Association Research Libraries. And in that capacity, he worked on their National Collaborative Data Infrastructure Project. From 2010 to 2012, Chuck was the lead investigator of uh, University of Alberta Libraries application to become one of the five data centers in the Canadian International Polar Year Data Assembly Centers, which has now become the Canadian Polar Data Network. And quite importantly for our community again, Chuck is right now a member of the CAL Working Group that launched in December 2013, so just a few months ago, to establish a Canadian Research Data Management Network. Please welcome Chuck Humphrey. Good morning. Um, when I was asked to, to uh, uh, present, I was uh, uh, told that this would be um, video recorded and, uh, and that to make sure that my PowerPoint slides were in very large print and that just threw me off of using PowerPoint at all. So I'm going to be describing digital infrastructure to you verbally. And, and that's a bit of a challenge because oftentimes when you start talking about uh, IT infrastructure, there's lots of slides with uh, schematics with elaborate systems presented on it. But uh, if um, you, the words had to be big, well then the slides would have had to be large of infrastructure. So we're gonna go on a verbal tour of digital infrastructure. And I figure if I, if I can convey the meaning of digital infrastructure orally to you, that I've made a big step forward in what this is all about. Um, Initially, I was asked to uh, uh, defend a position that I've taken about um, digital uh, infrastructure in Canada, and that is building it from the bottom up rather than the top down. And um, I was asked to take the counter position of that, you know, building from the top down instead. And um, as uh, uh, we found out that one of our um, colleagues wouldn't be able to uh, attend this morning, I thought, well, why don't I back up and, and start by talking about um, what digital infrastructure is and how it has changed dramatically in, in substance in a decade. Um, if you go back to um, one of the original concepts used to describe digital infrastructure, um, it was e-science. And e-science was actually a funding envelope um, initiated in the United Kingdom to find a way of providing uh, more extensive uh, support in building uh, compute grids, 
uh, the, the, that underlying infrastructure to support data in these large, uh, big science initiatives like the uh, Large Hadrian Collider, uh, uh, astronomic uh, telescopes, um, satellite uh, collected data. And uh, so the, the definition associated with e-science is computationally intensive science that is carried out in highly distributed network environments or science that uses immense data sets that require grid computing. The emphasis was on that underlying high-speed digital network and a compute grid on top of it. Data's mentioned, but data wasn't the, the big key component in the early stages of e-science. Now, e-science, we're talking about an era that's about 2002 to 2005. Those were the initial investments. Around 2007, we end up with kind of two branches in the, in the understanding of the, of, in the use of um, digital infrastructure in research. Um, first of all, the United States became active in this, and they coined their own term. Rather than e-science, they talked about cyber infrastructure. Now, cyber infrastructure um, it, it builds on the, this notion of having this underlying high-speed um, uh, research network and um, high-performance computing, but it adds some, some detail to it through a, um, a study that was commissioned by the NSF called Understanding Infrastructure. And this was a, a workshop where um, a, a group of, of, um, uh, of uh, business experts got together and talked about what, what, what's the underlying organizational structure that needs to accompany digital infrastructure. And they came up with, with a definition that cyber infrastructure, infrastructure is the set of organizational practices, technical infrastructure, and social norms that collectively provide for a smooth operation of scientific work at a distance. So they, they have three components, organizational practices, technical infrastructure, and social norms. And the emphasis is that research can be conducted at a distance. Um, at the same time that cyber infrastructure was being shaped around these three concepts and this notion of, of um, distance, being able to conduct research at a distance, uh, Jim Gray um, was advancing his uh, view of what e-science is all about. And he shifted it directly to data. Um, he talks about uh, the techniques and technologies for such data-intensive science are so different that it's uh, worth distinguishing data-intensive science from computational science. You know, the earlier models were really built around computational science. For Jim Gray, that meant that it was really built around simulation. Ex uh, ex the need for uh, high-performance computing to deal with um, very detailed uh, simulation models. Mm -hmm. But Jim switched it to saying that, well, we have that, and that's fine, but we also have this need for data-intensive science. And that is what, was, what he coined as the fourth paradigm uh, for scientific exploration. In fact, if you search the internet for fourth paradigm, you're likely to find a publication uh, by Microsoft that was um, uh, written in tribute to, to Jim. Jim uh, was a sailor and, and not too unlike the Malaysian uh, aircraft that went missing in the ocean. Jim went sailing one day and never came home. Mm -hmm. And um, the uh, community around him scoured satellite images looking for wreckage of a sailboat, uh, but never did find the sailboat. Um, so this is a tribute to, to Jim, this publication called Fourth Paradigm. Um, he points out that, that uh, with data-intensive science, uh, the goal for scientists is to codify their information so that they can exchange it with other scientists. And this is the beginning of the discussion of big data. It's not that we didn't have big data before uh, the last couple of years, but it is that the recognition that um, you can use data uh, across disciplines and domains if you, if you codify it correctly, um, that has really 
uh, heighten the, the uh, excitement about big data. When I look back at some of the presentations that were made around 2007, well, we're getting this shift now so that um, um, e-science is becoming more inclusive of, of other disciplines, including the social sciences and humanities. When I look at that time, I, I look back at some of the slides out of the EU where they're describing what their investments are going to be and what their models are. And uh, if you can just picture this in your mind, it's, it's, it's an architectural diagram where there's three underlying planks. And the bottom plank is the high-speed research network. The plank on top of it is a compute grid, that is high-performance computing. The plank on top of that was data. And then they drew elaborate uh, cones over the top of those three planks. And they started by dry, drawing a, um, a box that was called the virtual research environment, VREs. And you probably have encountered VREs um, being discussed um, in the literature. And uh, this was to establish communities of research by providing them with the necessary technology to communicate with one another and the computing resources to, to do, conduct analysis together and the data to, to work together. And uh, that was the 2007 initial EU model that was representing e-science. Uh, within 18 months, I saw another representation by the same speaker um, uh, which replaced the top box with virtual research environments and replaced it with data repositories. These were repositories that were to house the data from domains and make them interoperable with other domains. And so now the, the data um, platform and the, those three underlying uh, uh, structures have been elevated into a structure uh, around data repositories. And data repositories are an, a significant recognition by this community uh, dealing with e-science because we're talking about the collections of data, the management of data, the preservation of data, the access to data, and the focus became one from uh, insular research project to the wider area of, of, of uh, investigation, to all domains. And that's a fundamental shift. So now we have data re receiving its prominence in this realm of digital infrastructure. Move on to um, about 2011 when, when uh, um, in Canada, we thought we had coined uh, a concept that um, described this new environment. We, we, were, we were rather proud of ourselves. Um, and we, we defined research data management infrastructure as the configuration or mix of expertise, services, and technology organized locally or globally to support research data activities across the research life cycle. Now, for, that, for us, that was kind of the ultimate conclusion of the discussion that had been going on uh, those um, previous 10 years. And, and for us, that was the, the emphasis that was really required in Canada, uh, was this focus on a mix of expertise, services, and technologies. Now, that's not too unlike the um, understanding uh, infrastructure definition that cyber infrastructure involves. Um, you have to recognize that there is expertise required uh, to support data repositories, to facilitate the exchange of data among domains. Uh, it recognizes that, that you re require services uh, to maintain a collection of research data, to preserve the collection of research data. And clearly there has to be underlying uh, uh, information technology tied to this because it's all digital. So, that was uh, uh, similar to what um, the cyber infrastructure definition was, but what we tied it to um, the actual activities around the research life cycle that touch upon research data. And that has been our, our focus. Um, while I said we were quite proud of ourselves with coining a new concept, research data management infrastructure, um, I was searching the internet and discovered that roughly the same time we came up with that concept, JISC 
was running a funding envelope called Research and Data Management Infrastructure. So, um, you know, you, you can't become too proud of, of your accomplishments uh, because they're likely to have been done before at the same time by someone else. Um, let's move now the, the evolution of, of, um, of this whole digital infrastructure definition to March 4th of, of this year. Um, following the digital information uh, infrastructure, digital infrastructure summit in Ottawa, uh, hosted by the Leadership Council, um, uh, there was a report released that, that, that talked about the following context for digital infrastructure. Quote, there has been a cultural shift in how digital infrastructure is conceived. Instead of being considered as only machines that compute and, and data and high-speed networks that allow access to the data, quote, the machines and pipes, uh, it is now seen as the entire ecosystem that surrounds our ability to capture, manage, preserve, and use data, the core element of digital infrastructure. In other words, data are infrastructure, as uh, are the highly uh, skilled professionals who facilitate access to data, computational power, and networks. So this has moved us now into looking at digital infrastructure as part of a larger ecosystem, <clears throat> and data is prominent in uh, the purposes of that ecosystem. This fits in with, um, with Chad's um, definition of digital scholarship. We were in Montreal in um, October 2012 when Chad uh, introduced uh, the, his concept of digital scholarship in which he talked about um, research data also being uh, learning data and innovation data. And that is that uh, in the future with um, all scholarship uh, that we will have this, this integration. It's all about data. And uh, so um, that's, you know, again, part of that theme. Well, that's big data. Oftentimes, we think of big data only as all of those observations are generated by digital instrumentation like the Large Hadron Collider. But big data also consists of all the, the tens of thousands of smaller files that come together to give a representation of a field or an area of study. And that is another form of big data. It's often called the long tail of data because it's not um, particularly large with any single file, but cumulatively, it is as big or bigger than uh, one large file from uh, a digital observation uh, platform like the Large Hadrian Collider. So that's what, uh, the introduction that I wanted to bring to you about digital infrastructure. It has, ha it has had a dramatic shift in understanding uh, from uh, largely being uh, the IT platform upon which research is conducted to now this notion of an, of an ecosystem that involves the sharing of data within that ecosystem and the underlying technology facilitating that sharing of the data. Um, Maybe we could in ask for any questions at this point about, about whether or not that's a helpful um, way of characterizing where we're at. I think what's particularly important for the Social Science and Humanities Federation is that this brings our communities directly into the discussion of uh, digital infrastructure. If we don't step forward into it, it just move on as it did with the other sciences. But the door is open for us to be part of the digital infrastructure community. And this is, this is important because um, the recent Tri-Council um, Plus um, consultation on capitalizing on big data was uh, missing a voice from uh, the associations in this federation. They, there weren't a lot of associations that responded to the importance of that document. And um, I hope I'm talking to the people who can change that. Um, we do have a question, and we have a microphone since the session is being recorded, well, streamed live, but also recorded. 
for other delegates. So. My own? Thank you very much for your remarks. I'm Gail McDonald. I'm on the board of the Federation, and I'm an AVP at St. Thomas University and the Federation rep. Um, I brought this up at the board meeting yesterday in terms of, uh, and, and I, you say it more eloquently than I, we do need to be concerned about big data because conversely with the scientific model, with the hydrogen collider, with genomic research and that sort of thing where we can easily see what big data actually is, corporations are beginning to use the word big data to refer to all of the social media that they map to get market information about us. So I think if we're going to use the term big data or digital infrastructure, we have to be very clear in how we use it and not be as, as afraid of it. As social scientists and as humanists, we tend to be a little bit afraid of anything that looks like data unless it's qualitative. So we need to be, I think, much more cognizant of how we are part of this, how we become part of this. And I would like, my question to you is, what is the way forward for social scientists and for humanists in this? I see, for example, my younger colleagues in policy institutes and in research institutes embracing technology in ways that make professors look like dinosaurs and generating communities of conversation and data that I can't even find. So it, how, do we, how do we get from where we are, which is kind of old school, to this rapidly changing? And as you say, it sounds like much of it is a question of definition as opposed to, to actual transformation of systems themselves. So how do we move from where we are to, to a place where humanists and social scientists can embrace the concept of big data? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the tough question. How do we get from here to there? And um, I want to start by saying that um, some of the most innovative research happening in Canada right now is happening in the humanities around large text corpora. And um, that is a big data area for humanities. I don't know that, though, in the humanities it gets discussed as big data, though I, I know that Jeffrey Rockwell uh, presents it as uh, um, a big data um, topic. And Jeffrey is uh, um, at the University of Alberta, was uh, formerly at McMaster University, is um, part of uh, a network of, of uh, humanities researchers. Ray Siemens is also a part of that network. Susan Brown, uh, working with large text corpora. Um, and I, I think it's, it's, um, it's going to be kind of a next generation movement as well that we're going to see as, as the, the um, bright postdocs and graduate students now working with these people in that area, they're going to be carrying forward uh, that new uh, vision of, of how um, uh, big data becomes part of uh, the humanities, um, uh, mainstream part of the humanities. Uh, uh, Sure, sure. The idea from the humanities perspective is to try to rethink the questions and uh, maybe I should sort of specify that as a follow-up to this session, there will be on the Federation website links to various projects and initiatives so that people will be able to sort of find both Chuck's text and then these links. But to try to think what Franco Moretti has been discussing as kind of, um, you know, long distance reading. So how large scale and in some ways the most obvious example in the humanities will be Google Books and how Google Books has an initiative of large-scale digitization has made available, uh, you know, millions of volumes that you can search in one aspect. They do that within, you know, some limitations and obviously the need for expanding corpora um, and project and the tools, you know, that are also required. Sometimes the tools are not adapted to the needs of the social sciences and humanities researchers, so that's why people like Stéphane Sinclair, you know, mm -hmm. sadly is not here, and Jeffrey have developed a tool, you know, called Voyant for the last decade, you know, that helps working on that. What's been really quite important, maybe to complement, you know, Chuck's answer, is also to think about how in the last, you know, sort of uh, five years or so, much more than before, CFI has been working hand in hand with, you know, Shirk and, uh, you know, the social sciences and humanities, you know, community to try to listen, not always, you know, sort of implement, but at least listen to our needs and try to sort of change the way that 
how do we get to having that big data? You know, you know, whether it's called large corpora, whether it's just a question of scales, but to try to make the tools and the, uh, you know, the object of study available. In, in many ways, if you think about it, big data is just another form of you know, what, what we used to have close readings in the humanities, to think about text from, say, a post-colonial perspective. Now we can introduce a different perspective on the same text, except of comparing it manually, you know, mm -hmm. five texts at a time, taking 10 days in the library. You can do that in five minutes, comparing a million texts around that issue. So the question of scales is very important, but it still needs to be mastered and also that the tools, you know, be made available. And in that sense, you know, it's, it's important to make sure that we don't stand, we as researchers, next to the, the corporation doing big digitization projects. So Google Books is very handy, but tomorrow Google Books could also decide to make you pay for having access to the data. And, you know, Gale and other producers are doing mass digitization project of newspapers, you know, sort of all that. It's always important to just, you know, read the fine prints about, you know, what can we do with that data? And in that sense, you know, we see Shirk has been making that you know, as a kind of optional expenses that we can also do our own, you know, corpus. It's just trying to think about being part of that conversation. But then the other aspect that touches upon our workshop is obviously infrastructure in terms of physical support. Are we talking about, and that maybe we could have a segue to mm -hmm. some other conversation, are we talking about Compute Canada making available large-scale processing powers for everybody? Are we talking about universities each building their own institutional repository and sort of using the computer science people, um, you know, in their things? Or are we talking about regional efforts? That there's a whole series of, of uh, you know, opportunities on the table, all linked to obviously questions of, you know, funding, you know, not just the funding of setting it up, but also maintaining, you know, that infrastructure. And it's an important issue because if we give everything up to, say, Compute Canada that does things very well, and we have one representative, that's currently Susan Brown on the board, for instance, of Compute Canada for, for the Humanities, a researcher community. You know, it's one voice among many other voices. You know, and it's important, that's why you know, it's, it's great that the Federation, that actually did respond, and uh, the paper is available on the website, the response to the call for digital infrastructure was a, was a paper by the Federation made available, that we continue you know, making sure that we, we get there, because more and more you know, of what we study on a daily basis will fit under that umbrella of just, you know, sort of big data, you know, that's indeed, as you said, sometimes a bit unclear for our community. Well, can I just uh, add to that? I was walk walking down those three points of expertise, services, and technology. And the first one was expertise, and that is the development of this next generation of humanities researchers. The second step is services, and, and Michael touched on, on the services. The question is, um, what types of, of uh, centers need to be developed to support access to um, uh, large text corpora, objects of interest of, uh, to humanities researchers. And, and that's now uh, being um, conceived and, and there are uh, ideas coming, uh, congealing around, well, what, what, what should we have, a national center? Should we have a network of centers? And that's being debated now. Uh, and the third thing is, is the IT. Now, the IT is actually uh, pretty much in, in existence. How do you take advantage of the existing IT? Canary, how do you take advantage of Compute Canada? So I just wanted to work that definition into the, the answer about how do we get where we're going. Sorry. Your, your last answers are actually completely in line with the question I was going to ask. Uh, my name is Linda Silva. I'm a professor at uh, the School of Library and Information Science at University of Montreal. And um, there it seems to me there are at least two different preoccupations that we should have listening to your, your presentation. Um, one is the... Um, what we need to manage the data. So how do we describe what we have? Do we, how do we house it? How do we make it accessible? How do we organize it, indexing, et cetera? And it seems to me there should be strong links there with digital libraries, which is something I did not hear, but I assume that's a big part of it. So that's one aspect uh, that may be more linked to the technology so that might be more of a consideration for pure sciences researchers. However, definitely librarians are very involved in that aspect. 
And a second preoccupation is the use of the data. How, how do we use it? How does a researcher uh, make sense of what's there? And of course, that presupposes that the information has been um, um, organized and, and housed and preserved in a way that will make that possible. But the expertise to know how to, uh, to use it, that, that's new and that's probably never even been possible before because of the inaccessibility of that quantity of data. data. So I think um, two, two different areas of research there. Mm -hmm. How would you react to that? I'm in a library. Um, if, if I've ignored mentioning digital library, it's, it's because I assume that the digital library has a critical role to, to play in the infrastructure as part of the services. And, I, and fortunately, um, I work with a number of researchers who take the same perspective. They see the library as being critical to providing them services. They're researchers. They don't see it um, worth, uh, or it, they don't want to take their valuable time spending providing services to their research colleagues. They want to do research. So they're looking to the library for that service base. And um, I think that through the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, uh, there is a, a strong understanding and a will to uh, develop digital infrastructure uh, for um, researchers in Canada. And, and uh, um, Martha Whitehead at, at Queen's uh, University, who's the uh, university librarian there, uh, is chair of a subcommittee that specifically addresses data management. Um, and is now a leading um, a group that is looking at how we might build um, a Canadian research data management network. That is how through a, a, um, collaboration we might set up services that span one institution to support the wider research agenda in Canada. Hi, Victor. And I'm also uh, here at the Congress for the Canadian uh, Society for the Study of Education. Uh, one of the, th this is an important, very important, and quite complex uh, world of concepts and definitions. And in my experience, we've had big data in Canada for a long time. And so it hasn't been discovered, it's been expanded. And uh, there are, uh, uh, Chuck and his colleagues uh, have led in Canada something called the Data Liberation Initiative. And there's an importance into the idea of data liberation because there's a difference between existing, the existence of big data and actually getting a hold of it. And this is a small p political and economic activity. And so in conceptualizing the huge opportunities that the next generation of big data might bring. Uh, this is a world of choices. It sits in a more important world of privacy. And to some large extent, it's defined by provincial governments and municipal governments. And uh, wherever we're going, Big data, A, needs to remember where we came from because the work we've achieved, there's a danger of being overwhelmed by the great next opportunity, mm -hmm. that we have thousands of scholars in Canada who've been working with big data in their own practice and working with next generations of graduate students. And that might be the current constituency we have wonderful uh, librarians, data librarians across this country who are working every day with data and big data to help scholars and the work is really unrecognized. They are a, a community that every day is responding to graduate students, student and academic needs for support. And so I'll, I'll just try to put a semicolon in a way, big data is wonderful, but if you don't have Sherpas, you don't have to worry about the big data. <laughs> if you don't have people who understand this world, 
and this is an asset that requires investment. And in the provincial context, this is not an important concept. Governments are looking at meeting the needs or the opportunities of open data, and there that could be seen as their response to big data. Well, we need to have open data, and it's, it's a trend, etc. And open data might be actually the lock and key against big data and against small data. By doing that, it's their replacement for the work that we've done over the last 10 or 15 years. So I understand uh, Chuck's description, I think is really important. We need liberation, we need Sherpas to get any value out of big data. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. You, you've always been a loyal supporter of, of our data efforts and, and, and you, we really appreciate that. Um, I, I do want to add that um, data access is, is an area where we've had su success in Canada in certain areas. What we haven't had success is in data preservation. And uh, that is covered largely in the paper that, that is distributed um, as part of this session. Uh, and it's uh, kind of that, the historical uh, context that, that, Victor, you were, you were pointing out, um, that uh, um, we have in Canada um, a network of, of uh, data librarians that, that strive to um, deliver data to, to their research community, um, but we um, are dependent on um, a large uh, agency to, to ensure that that data persists, and there have been occasions where that hasn't happened, uh, and we're losing uh, valuable research data daily. Uh, a researcher has their data on a workstation, they replace their workstation, and accidentally the data doesn't get transferred, and that machine gets recycled, and the data are gone. That's a common common occurrence. That's not a, a rare occurrence. Um, and so a, a, a large part of this new movement around uh, digital infrastructure is to build the preservation support for research data, build the large collection of data that is part of that, and to ensure that it, it is here. Now, um, uh, Michael mentioned um, my involvement with uh, the Canadian Polar Data Network. That, that grew out of the International Polar Year, in which Canada was a participating country. The IPY meets every 50 years. So the last time they met, that was really in the, it, you know, right at the um, beginning era of um, widespread um, computing technology. And the, there was a lot of data that was lost in those 50 years. Impressively, the Department of Fishery and Oceans also had a lot of that data from that 50 year, over that 50 year period and, and uh, had preserved it. Intentional actions to preserve it. Um, our goal is to preserve the data that was collected in this last IPY 50 years. I'm not gonna be around. But I'm hoping that, that what we do and the practices that we establish and, and, and the systems we establish will be around 50 years. And, and we're following uh, the best practices that are emerging out of the digital library community to ensure that. Um, the, uh, I'm not sure that you're, you're aware of the, and, and, and Victor mentioned that we often go um, in the background without a lot of notice. I don't know if you've realized that your libraries since the late 90s have been producing valuable digital collections. They're taking print resources, digitizing them, putting them together in collections, allowing uh, um, the research community to have new resources for, for conducting research. And those are valuable assets. Um, and so the library community um, in, the, in the last uh, dozen years or more has been also concerned about how do we preserve those valuable assets. You know, you spend a lot of money producing something, you don't want to lose it. And we're finally getting university administrations to also recognize that these are valuable assets and the institutions are making policies that say, um, we need to protect our uh, digital assets, we need to, to practice uh, digital stewardship. And that, that's an important breakthrough because that gives the foundation by which these actions uh, around preserving our digital content uh, can be based upon. 
Um, so uh, the library community has been developing um, um, uh, best practices and systems to support digital collections well into the future. And it's a matter now of organizing uh, um, the scientific community, the research community, to take advantage of the, those, uh, the knowledge and, and the practices and integrate that into a national network. We have a question on the side. Just jump in before you ask your question to also indicate in link to that. Those of you who have yet to uh, consult or see the outcome of the Shirks Digging Into Data competition has been a very interesting effort in the last six years to try to, they've now had three rounds of competitions, international competitions, to really say, you know, like, we now have more and more of these data sets already, in, you know, established, and to encourage researchers who don't need to make the data or create the data, but simply to use the data already available through that, you know, sort of funding opportunities. So if you haven't had a chance to look at not only the, uh, the program itself, but the uh, researchers involved, um, some of them this year were, you know, McGill was, you know, well positioned in this last round of, of uh, winner's team, but check out the Digging Into Data competition at Shirk. It's a great bridge between, you know, the more traditional way of doing SSH scholarships and trying to think about these new sets of, of uh, large-scale data sets that are available. I, I'm Bruce Muirhead from the University of Waterloo, and um, I have a question about definitions. I think probably I thought initially it felt, followed on from the previous question, but perhaps it doesn't. And I'm just wondering about this whole big data thing. What we do in the humanities doesn't seem to me to be big data at all. I uh, sit on the Southern Ontario Smart Computing Innovation Platform uh, Management Board, which is a high, you know, it's high performance computing. They have a blue gene Q computer. Those guys do high perform. Those guys are big data. You know, they do billions of calculations a second on that computer. You know, computer science, electrical engineering, and I wonder if big data isn't somehow for a, we're trying to ape the sciences in terms of terminology. I don't understand where that kind of big data, which I guess is a fairly well accepted idea, um, comes into play with the humanities. Also, the digital humanities. I I don't think I could write now without accessing the internet constantly. You know, I just sit on my computer now and you can write articles. I'm a historian by training. Oddly enough, I can do that with history topics as well. Does that then make me a digital historian? In a sense, is that what digital humanities is about? You know, and um, it was mentioned, I think, a bit earlier that um, big um, data, data can consist of thousands of smaller files that come together to give a feel for a field of study. That sounds exactly what I was doing in an archives. You know, so we changed the terminology and I don't quite understand why we've changed the terminology, unless it's to be au courant with the 21st century. You know, and maybe we have to be in terms of shirk. You know, I know, Chad, you've made a career almost of this uh, of digitization and data. But I don't understand, you know, I, I guess I don't really understand what a good working, condition, working definition of digital humanities would be. And I've tried, other than using the internet, and sort of I think that digitizing books and digitizing collections that doesn't seem to me to be big data. You know, you're not doing the billions of calculations a second that you need to on certain, um, say if you're a computer scientist working on health informatics or something. So I wonder if we're, <laughs> I, I have often wondered if we're sort of confusing um, the community in a needless sort of way in order to buy into what's current now, in a sense, in terms of, um, of digital humanities, digitization, big data, that sort of thing. And if you could actually um, tell me what digital humanities really is, I'd really appreciate that. The last thing I'll just say too, this is a comment about this open data stuff. We actually, um, there was a line item in the last federal budget of um, $3 million, and it's based at the University of Waterloo, but it's an open data initiative that um, a couple of local Communitech and open text and um, desire to learn and University of Waterloo are now involved in, in terms of creating a platform for open data um, for government, municipal, provincial, and federal. I won't give you a definition for digital humanities. Okay. I'll, 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 I'll stay with digital uh, infrastructure. But um, you know, part of, of the challenge of big data is being able to use resources across domains. And that requires linkage. And that is a big data problem. Just because you have uh, 
a moment where you're looking for the Higgs boson and you've captured two terabytes of data on a flash of, of the, that data is really consistent. It's a small set of attributes that they're measuring repeatedly over a burst of time that generates this massive file. To me, that's less interesting big data than taking um, all of the um, newspapers that have been digitized and uh, trying to find in it um, the coverage of uh, the pandemic of 1917. Um, that to me requires linkage, that requires a, a, um, cross-disciplinary understandings of going to, to medical journals that were covering the same topic as well as newspaper coverage, trying to understand what was really uh, behind the, the pandemic and understanding how to respond to the pandemic, and looking changes in, in medical practices. That requires a, a level of computation around um, a, a digital collection that is big data. It's the act of linking across domains that makes it big data, not simply the volume. It seems that there's a um, there's behind the scenes like those guys. I would agree if you do that kind of thing, uh, uh, that is big data. And there's a, we have a, a great young colleague in the history department of Waterloo who deals with big data, searching words. You know what's um, current in a in X or Y year, and what does that then can you extrapolate in terms of uh, what society is all about at that particular time? I mean, behind the scenes stuff is big data. Uh, but how does that big data? when I'm sitting at my computer and I'm going across domains like that, going from Google Books to newspapers to journal articles, how's that big data? And it, I get the impression that that's presented to us in the humanities community as we're using big data. I guess we are using big data. You are sense, using big data, but yes. But I'm not doing, I mean, I think it's, a, okay, well, I won't say anything more about yeah. this. Yeah, so, the nice thing is that it's so transparent, you re don't realize you're using big data. <laughs> so in that, that sense, it's been a, we've been successful. Uh, um, I, I don't know that we need to get um, hung up about, um, you know, exactly whether or not the humanities um, have arrived in, in big data. I believe you have. Um, the, the critical point is the, are you using the big data? And, I, and it's re, relates back to the question on this side of the room with is, you know, what's the next step? Um, well, how do we get there? And, and um, in some senses, uh, uh, in some sense, you've already have arrived because you're taking advantage of the tools like the internet and some of the services that exist that allow you to, to mine uh, these uh, large uh, text corpora, or these uh, uh, large digital collections. And um, I don't know that you have to get hung up on whether or not you're a big data uh, researcher or not. Fact is, is that behind you is big data in the humanities. And maybe I'll put my hat as, you know, President French of the Canadian Society for Digital Humanities, you know, for a sec to tell you that in some ways the explanation would require another you know, workshop altogether for what digital communities are, but the short version is often time to think about its origin in Canada in, in the 1960s you know, sort of in terms of humanities computing, which at the time the term was much more explicit about using you know, sort of um, IBM at the time, mainly processor to help doing large scale concordances and that kind of tools that couldn't be done by hand you know, in less than say 25 years. As we move forward, it became a series of methodology and tools to try to explore not only textual data, but also you know, sound and visual. And so the uh, kind of permeance of the field is, is quite you know, ingrained now. What I would say for your questions about big data, it's, it's indeed maybe should be called bigger data <laughs> rather than big data, because we used to have you know, in an archive all that information except that now you can access more, more of it. And as Chuck mentioned, the opportunity to do that across a range of databases. Not always quite as efficiently. That's why we also need still to develop tools. Mm -hmm. And we need to go back to um, you know, Lynn's questions about standards, you know, because these mm -hmm. silo design you know, data sets have yet to properly speak to each other. And that's where also an important crossword uh, for us to make sure that we have all these data sets, but they actually can communicate. I uh, you know in the right way, so that we can get to uh, an even bigger, you know, data in that sense. 
Allison. Um, so uh, I agree with the kind of analysis that you're offering about how things have changed. Um, but I think that what I heard in the last question is also that this is in fact a strategic decision on the part of the social sciences and humanities. I mean, if we recast what we do and how we do it, and if we have the benefit of multiple new sources of information that have now been digitized. It allows us to do all sorts of things that we might not have been able to do quite so easily. Mm -hmm. And with the benefit of technology, we can change the nature of our practice. But I think that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this is also very much a strategic decision. Mm -hmm. It is a strategic decision on the part of these disciplines to say, our, our work also requires, if we want to do this kind of work, we have these new kinds of questions and so on, um, that, that our work should receive the same, same kinds of support that those folks that are doing, you know, gazillions of, you know, computations within a, a mm. second, right? It's, it's a different kind of work that now has the benefit of technology behind it. And I think, so I think that, you know, there's both con the content and substantive, substantive kinds of considerations, but I don't think that we can rule out that they're also very strategic and I would argue political and economic considerations mm -hmm. that underlie this in very, very significant ways. Uh, you know, I, I certainly am not privy to the conversations that took place around uh, the big data, you know, the, this whole notion of big data within the social sciences and humanities, or, you know, um, s some of the competitions that have been held by Shirk. But you can well imagine, I mean, I'm, I'm going back in time to the first few competitions of CFI. And CFI wouldn't have entertained, you know, they wouldn't have entertained uh, the kind of repositories and digital kinds of collections with the, within the humanities and social sciences because it was just not seen as that kind of science, right? It wasn't seen as infrastructure. That's right. And, and now it is, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a greater recognition yes. of it. So I, I think that we should be really clear that there were political and very strategic dimensions to this work in mm -hmm. addition to whatever the substantive disciplinary or interdisciplinary considerations mm -hmm. were. Yeah, and in the paper that I have in conjunction with this, I talk about top-down and bottom-up development, something that uh, we were going to debate today, uh, Stefan and I. And, and uh, um, I, I consider the, the top-down development to be uh, particularly important around policy. And so, or as you say, the, the strategy and the, the political decisions that go out. That's, that's really important when you, uh, to do the, uh, the, to develop digital infrastructure from the top down built around policy. And um, I had taken that position um, for I, at least two decades before I changed my mind in the last three years where now I'm an advocate for bottom-up. And my bottom-up argument is around operational activities, not policy. I, I can't see in Canada how operationally we can build this digital infrastructure from the top down. We don't have a federal minister of education. You look at the successes in Europe, it's come out of ministries of education. We have 10 provinces of ministers of education. Uh, try to get any harmony there. Um, we've got to work with the uh, institutions that are identified as memory institutions that already agree that this is an area in which uh, they're committed to, to become engaged or are engaged. And to get them to work together to build up to that um, top-down policy direction. Uh, part of that, that bottom-up operational uh, needs the guidance from the top-down. But also, um, that bottom-up needs to have some uh, contribution to the, to the top-down policy-making. And so the, the question that I asked in my paper is, how far down is bottom? 
And that's from a top perspective. When you ask that question, how far down is bottom, you're looking at from it from the top. And so the more we can shrink the top and the bottom in terms of these development, the, the more I think we'll be, we'll be successful. Yes, my name is Patrick Fafard from the University of Ottawa. I was at a, a round table two weeks ago and somebody was trying to, just, to look just over the horizon to sort of the next five years and the, and the world he was describing was one in which the amounts of data are going to expand exponentially. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, and the idea was our ability to collect data, real-time data about sort of behavior is growing exponentially. And it has all sorts of impl implications. Um, so whereas before we would have done an experiment, now we would actually have real-time data and we can do things. But it was very fuzzy as he was describing it. I could take advantage of your, you know, your awareness. Are we looking at a world in which the sheer amount of data is increasing and we can do more interesting stuff with it if we can manage it? Um, uh, once was in a debate with a traditional archivist and the, the traditional archivist started by saying, you can't keep it all. And, and, I, and I said, well, why do you ask that question? Shouldn't the question be, why would you want to keep it all? Because we can do that in the digital context. We can ask, why would you want to keep it all? Because if you don't have metadata associated with something, you're never going to find something if you, if you save it digitally. And so um, the question is, we're seeing it. In fact, it's in the newspaper this morning about Canada wanting to do more with metadata, not less with mo metadata. I mean, uh, this is around um, all of the telecommunications that occur, and it's the envelopes in, in our emails, envelopes around our, our phone conversations. And um, so that's the metadata that, that allows um, um, uh, to geolocate someone or to, to uh, uh, track time points when people are corresponding and whatnot without getting into the content of what's in the message. And, and the same thing goes with all this voluminous data that we're collecting. If, if we don't have the metadata that will allow us to manage the data, um, uh, it's why would we want to keep it? Because uh, it is, it's true, the, the volume of it is, is, uh, is going to be, um, uh, just cause uh, the more needles in, in more haystacks. And, uh, but I, I do want to want to address the concern that well, we won't be able to save it all because we won't have enough storage. And storage technology is now working at the molecule level. You can take a gene and there's three strands and you only need two to do a binary coding. You know, that third strand for parity checks. But a speck of dust could contain um, uh, more metadata or more data than, than what we keep now in Canada. So, I, you know, I, I, I don't think it's the fact that we won't be able to store it. It's how we store it, how we manage it, that's going to be the critical thing. So we have time for a couple of questions. So, go ahead. I wanted to follow on, yeah, it's on. I wanted to follow on what Gail was saying about, um, you know, the private sector and, and us moving into this, not, not simply as humanities and social sciences versus sciences, but us moving into it as education sector versus other sectors from the public, uh, like the public's other parts of the government, um, within the government, and also versus pr the private sector. And, and the reason I come at this is because, <laughs> you know, what I study are, are databases that pertain to population and their misuse, their abuse. So you were talking about, you know, emails and phone trackings and so on. So I don't study how to do that. I study how it's done and the negative effects on the population. And I'm, you know, so I'm coming at it from a social sciences rather than humanities perspective. But I'm wondering, can we add to that? So I'm not talking now again about the libraries, the repositories, the, the memory of the the finished product, if you like. Now I'm talking about the raw data. So an anthropologist goes out, transcribes, videotapes, gets permission, goes through ethics boards, um, doesn't necessarily have to maintain confidentiality, but the expectation of the interviewee, for example, I'm just giving an example so there's something tangible to work with, um, you know, has an assumption that this will be used by this particular researcher where there's a rapport established and so on. Then this goes into a repository is used by other. So I'm, I'm thinking the ethics, I'm thinking the social sciences, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of our contribution in that sense. 
and I'm thinking of also other sectors simultaneously using big data in other ways. And the driving model for ethics review of human subject data is clinical trials. And that's a very extreme outlook on human subjects. And we're never clear with the um, clinical trials research whether we're actually protecting the pharmaceutical companies or the subjects of the research. But that's been the driving model. That's changing now because of the sheer volume of human subject data that we have. We have to look afresh at that. So the, the, the situation, the example that you provide, the consent form wasn't done correctly. You said that I'm, uh, you know, I'd like you to participate in this research and it'll be for my research. That consent form should also stipulate this data could be shared with other researchers who have undergone uh, ethics approval to use it. Give the bigger context for which uh, um, the data might be used. And, and I think that's what we've got to start communicating. I, every time I read an article where some person has left their laptop with, with health uh, data on it, and then there's this uh, potential disclosure of, of two, 300,000 Canadians and all their health. I, I cringe because I know what that message is to the public is you can't let that data out. You can't, you know, that, that data just has to be sealed away somewhere. And, and what the data needs is proper management. And if that management is proper, uh, you can allow for research uses of that data. Uh, and, but you need to have uh, the ethics system that is based on today's uh, technology and capabilities, uh, not the old clinical trial model, but today's technology. You have to incorporate that into the practices. Um, it does not give researchers a blank check to do whatever they want because they've got technology today, but it structures it in today's environment, not the environment of 40, 50 years ago. Uh, last question? No, you're good? Okay, no. So, well, um, please join me in thanking Chuck for his um, remarks this morning. And so watch out in, a, in the next few weeks for, you know, check paper and then more slide and information about big data and, and um, on the website of the Federation. Thank you.